Today, we're going to talk about nearly 10 things that bother me when it comes to the trading and investing community and culture online. It's not all inclusive. It's not really ranked in any order. It's just nearly 10 things that really bother me. Number one, overconfidence. When someone says they're 100% sure that a stock's going to go up in the next week, don't listen to them. That's the type of person you shouldn't listen to. And even if it does go up and they come back and say, ha ha, you idiot, it's probably not because of the reason they postulated. It's probably because of different factors or combination of factors that they hadn't considered. Someone who says they're 100% correct does not have the IQ to be correct. That makes sense. Everything that has to do with trading and investing, anything that has to do with the markets has an underlying percentage of confidence. For example, you might say a stock is a buy over the next month, but there's underneath that a level of confidence. Maybe you're 60% confident that stock will go up over the next month. That's going to factor into how you handle that trade. You might have a smaller position size because it's really only a little bit better odds than a coin flip. You might, if you're trading credit spreads, have a little bit more of an out of the money put credit spread so that there's a higher chance of success. Sure, you'll make less money if you're right, but it gives you a little bit of a cushion because it doesn't have to go up. In fact, it could go down a little bit. So everyone and every investment has a level of confidence that should be just about justified by some analysis, whether that be fundamental or technical or a combination of the two. But if someone says they're 100% sure about something, do not listen to them. And I'm 100% sure about that. Number two, the all or nothing mentality. And by that, I mean trading and investing live on polar opposite realms, and they are very polarizing. It seems like when people try out options or trading, they go all in options or trading, and they use their whole portfolio to try it out, and they either get burnt or too stressed out and they end up backpedaling all the way over to like index ETFs. There's a whole middle ground between the two that seems relatively untapped by some people. There's people that live there, but still a lot of people polarize towards Wall Street bets, YOLO all my money or Warren Buffett, I'm a boring investor, index ETFs maybe if I don't know how to choose stocks. There's a middle ground where maybe most of your money is in long-term investing. As a young person, probably a concentrated portfolio of stocks, not index ETFs. That's more for old geezers, in my opinion. And then some of your money, maybe 15%, 20% is towards options trading and trying that out. Another 5% is towards swing trading with stocks. Another 2% maybe towards trying out day trading, whatever. So there's, there's a gradient of risk. You have to figure out what your risk tolerance is, but it shouldn't lie in index ETFs if you're my age, in my opinion. And it shouldn't lie in YOLOing all your money. It should lie somewhere in the middle. So don't feel polarized. There's, there's not only two options. There's a combination, right? Number three, uh, a lot of YouTubers, especially younger YouTubers trying to get subs, will say, subscribe if you want to learn how to trade for a living. The only way you can really trade for a living is if you're already rich, that the position sizes you use are large, yet a small portion of your portfolio. So they generate a lot of cash, maybe a small percentage return, but a lot of cash because you already have so much money to work with. It's pretty much impossible to make a living trading unless you're doing something outside of that, like maybe teaching trading like I do, talk about the topic, make funny memes, put it on a mug and sell it on Etsy. Those are different. You can monetize it in different ways, but making trading uh, income directly from your trades, number one, is highly, highly, highly unlikely unless you already have a lot of money. And number two, you wouldn't really want that anyway. It sounds exciting and appealing at first when you first get into this, but if you're a day trader, you're staring at three ticks down on the candle, four ticks up, five ticks down, seven ticks up, and the whole time you're anxious. And even if you're not a day trader, you still have to deal with the fact that your income is dependent on your success. And that's stressful. You can't even budget. You might have months where you actually don't make any money or lose money. And think about how that plays with your mentality. If you're losing money three months in a row and you need that money, I got to pay bills pretty soon, or my wife's getting pissed, I'm losing all our, our cash supply. That's going to play with your head. You're probably going to take more risks. You're going to start burning more cash. It can be this downward financial spiral into ruin. So for most people, it's just impossible. So when someone says, smash that subscribe button and I'll teach you how to trade for a living, don't trust them. Number four, uh, a lot of people say dividend investing is great and you should pursue that to unveil a means of passive income. In my opinion, that's uh, kind of stupid. If you want to learn all about this, watch this video up in the corner. I did a video on this exact topic. Number five, you can make take a lot of risk on now as a young person because if you lose money, you can always recoup it over time. And this is true, but a lot of people interpret this as I got to YOLO all my money and if I lose it all, no big deal. I have 40 years until retirement. I'll recoup that money. It's true, you have time to recoup the money you lost, but it's not addressing the fact that every dollar that you lose is not just a dollar. It's that dollar plus all the compound interest you would accrue from now until you retire. So you're losing more than a dollar when you lose a dollar in the market. So when someone says you can risk more now, it should be interpreted as, 
as a young person, I should be maybe not doing index ETFs, but maybe have a concentrated stock portfolio. Maybe 20% is used towards options or selling cash secured puts. Uh, maybe another 10% is trying swing trading and a little bit trying day trading. That's, that's what it means, putting on that kind of extra risk. You're trying to generate alpha, extra return over a benchmark like the S&P 500. You're trying to do that now while you're young because if things do go really wrong, you can recover. It's okay. Now's the time to try to generate extra alpha. When you're older, you might try, you might move your money into index ETFs and bonds. With index ETFs and bonds, you're trying to just re reduce as much risk as possible, protect your wealth, and try to match systematic risk, which is just the risk of being in the market, which means you have to have a very large amount of holdings in your portfolio. Concentration builds wealth as a young person. Diversification protects it as you approach retirement. So don't just view the fact that you can risk more now as uh, uh, a free pass to YOLO your whole entire portfolio, okay? Unless you don't care about the outcome. Number six is kind of a personal one for me. Okay, hits home. Uh, I, I hear a lot of people say, this is too hard. Options are too hard. I can't learn this. I'll never be able to learn this. I give up. That's not true. You can learn this, and I totally believe you can. The reason I believe this is because, you know, what was it, two, three years ago in my sophomore year of college, I'm, I'm a, got a BS in finance, uh, it was a spring semester, and I was just not in a good mental headspace, and I kept dropping classes until I only had two classes left. And by the end of the semester, I got Ds in both of those classes. And yet, I still consider myself competent and maybe even slightly advanced in my understanding of how options work and how to trade them and not lose all your money. So if I can suck that much, and I really was not a good student overall, that was just a prime example of that. It means that you can figure it out too. It takes little baby spoonful bites at a time of little facts and, and, and bits of information that compound and build on each other until you have a full flushed out understanding. It's a never ending world. There's stuff I don't know about options still and strategies that I just have never tried. So it, it never ends, right? You should never feel like it's over, but you, to get a good foundation, it's entirely possible for everybody and, and less you're literally a vegetable. Don't take that as an insult if you struggle. <laughs> Number seven. Over aggressive technical analysis on YouTube or subreddits, whatever. I'll see screenshots or videos of stock charts like this one with tons of lines marking levels of support and resistance all over the place. So much so that you can't determine which one's more valid than the other. It's just total gibberish and they're overdoing it. Or they'll have a thousand different indicators on their screen and are trying to analyze which one means what and wait for them all to line. Just don't listen to those guys. Don't do that kind of stuff. Technical analysis is really simple. All it is doing is trying to find a trend as early as possible and relies generally on looking at the candles. Where's the sentiment at? Is it look like buyers are taking over or sellers are taking over? Looking at volume to see how valid moves are. Uh, analyzing levels of support and resistance that are reasonable. You really shouldn't have more than two or three lines on your chart at a time. Otherwise, you're just overdoing it. And analyzing some stock chart patterns as well. I'll be doing uh, live streams here relatively soon. Uh, I'm not going to say a date yet because I can't hold myself to it, but relatively soon um, where I will be discussing technical analysis and doing actual trades, getting input from you guys, options trading and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to see that happen, you know what to do. Technical analysis is simple. Looking at where's the momentum at, where's the volume at, where's the level of support and resistance at, is it breaking out? And maybe some chart patterns, although those are kind of towards the back because there's so, so much like a Rorschach test that people just hallucinate them everywhere. And that brings me to number eight, which is everyone thinks everything they see is a pattern, especially new beginners. You'll see it on the line uh, charts on Robinhood. They'll see patterns in that somehow. Patterns are not everywhere. Not everything is a pattern. A chart pattern is hurting behavior that is displayed across a stock chart and repeats across time in similar events. That does not happen constantly. They're not constantly there. They are there, but they're not constantly there. So don't hallucinate patterns all the time. If you see something that stands out to you, you should study patterns. And if something stands out to you, there it is. But don't go hunting for it. Because if you go hunting for it, you're going to, you're going to, it's a Rorschach test. You're going to see it when it's not there. Not everything is a pattern. And really, chart patterns should be at the back of the list because they're so subjective that some person might see one there while the other person might see one there and they don't see each other's. It's very subjective, so it should be at the back of the list. It should be price action, momentum, volume, uh, maybe moving averages. You can throw RSI in there, looking at support and resistance, but chart patterns are at the very back, in my opinion, unless it's really blatant and just right in your face. So don't hunt for them. See them when they're there. Uh, don't see them when they're not. <laughs> Easier said than done. And to kind of wrap it up, I just want to say most people, in my opinion, as a young person, should stay away from index ETFs, but should still have the majority of their portfolio in long-term investments. That was That's how I've been for the past couple of years. 
when I moved the my money out of Robinhood and I put a large portion of my portfolio into M1 Finance so that it's just over there doing compound interest. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to touch it. It's all automated. It's great. If you want to sign up, link down below. But then I take some of my money and I put it in a separate brokerage account that I use for trading options and doing more riskier trading endeavors. So I think the most, the biggest takeaway out of everything I've said so far is don't be polarized into index funds or YOLOing your money. There's a middle ground that still involves a concentrated portfolio of stocks that is the majority of your portfolio while you use some of your money to generate some extra alpha as well, doing swing trading or options or trying just different things like that. See if you're good at it. If you want to support my identical twin brother who edits my videos, he just sits in a dark room editing them whenever I put one out. He's basically my bitch. Uh, you can buy his merch down below. All the money goes to him and it's pretty good stuff. If you want some free stocks, sign up for Webull, deposit 100 bucks, get two free stocks. You can sign up for M1 Finance as well. I think it's a great way to automate your long-term investment so you don't have to think about it. You can just focus solely on trading. There's other free stock stuff down there and I love ya. I hope to see you guys in future live streams and I'll see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.